Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to speak today about um, cannabis genetics and what long read sequencing has done for us, particularly the, these um, highly accurate hi-fi sequencing reads. Um, we are looking at cannabis sativa L, which is uh, a very uh, repeat-rich genome. It's been very difficult to sequence with other tools outside of, um, of hi-fi, and we, we've tried them all. Uh, so we're going to touch on a few of those techniques and how these longer reads and these higher accuracy reads have actually helped us resolve uh, many of the repeat structures in the genome. And uh, most importantly, the cannabinoid synthase cluster, which is really key to understanding the chemotype of the plant. Uh, so we're going to break this up into some of the assembly statistics that go on first, um, and then how those uh, references have enabled other sequencing tools and genotyping tools to, um, to make better use of the reference genome, and then also any cloning exercises that um, we've embarked on to, uh, to get interesting enzymes out of, out of the genome and utilize those for industrial purposes. So um, this started... Uh, in a quest uh, to actually try and sort out um, powdery mildew resistance uh, and, and fungal resistance in general. W one of the largest um, reasons for crop failure in cannabis is, uh, is yeast and mold. Uh, so there's a wide diversity of cannabis plants out there and some are very resistant to yeast and molds and others are not. And a common phenotype you can see is this powdery mildew phenotype that exists on, um, on some cultivars and not in others. Uh, and this can reduce yield by 40% or more. Um, and even, even in the... Um, uh, the cannabis um, dispensary pipelines, they have really strict yeast and mold criteria and microbial um, criteria so that none of the inhaled products can end up creating uh, aspergillosis or other types of um, risk to immunocompromised patients. So the yeast and mold problems uh, are really, really important one in the cannabis field. And we, um, we spend a lot of time trying to understand the, the parts of the genome that may in fact uh, inform uh, the resistance uh, of these particular plants. So we set out to sequence the genome uh, many years ago, and we did put up this uh, preprint a year ago, and um, there's a lot of data in here, and we have some additional data to share, uh, but we did do a population survey. Uh, outside of sequencing a trio on PacBio with CLR, the older form of the, of the technology um, that provides very long reads but doesn't have the, um, the CCS in it, and we also threw 42 more genomes with Illumina on top of this to get an understanding of the diversity that exists in the genome. Um, so just to give you a sense, the trio we sequenced, this again was all done with, um, with the continuous long read mode. And these are very respectable assemblies for cannabis. In fact, these are some of the best that are out there. Um, and I think it's predominantly due to the fact that we, we started last. Uh, the, tech, the read lengths get better and better over time. And we jumped on the problem a little later than other people. And uh, we pushed for really, really long read lengths. And these ended up giving us um, uh, assemblies that are... Uh, you know, in, in the N50 range of, of one to, to three and a half megabases. Um, largest ones ever seen yet. I think most other assemblies are, are struggling to hit up to a megabase. Uh, and, uh, and the genome size ranges on whether it is a female or a male. The male has a Y chromosome, which is the largest chromosome in the genome. Uh, BUSCO scores are one way to estimate completeness. Now, notice that we still have perhaps some challenges here in deduplicating and that's due to some of its repetitive content and how diverse the two um, parental lines can in fact be. So um, the, the, the harder and harder you try to deduplicate the genome, the more likely you are to lose some of the cannabinoid synthase genes because they sit in these repeat forests that are very similar. And so the, the tools that split the haplotype sometimes throw out the wrong ones in the process of doing this. Um, but nevertheless, we repeated this with HiFi. And the assemblies jumped up to 5.2 meg with a high canoe. We've had a couple other assemblies push these out to 9 megabases as well. Um, and uh, they, they all vary in the way that they deduplicate things. So uh, if you look at the BUSCO scores for these, uh, there's 97% if you go with what's been heavily deduplicated. But if you run BUSCO on both the primary and the alts, you'll see that uh, the difference between 93 and 97 is really how many of the alternate haplotags it's throwing out, and maybe those aren't really alternate haplotags. Maybe they are similar enough in repeat structure that um, they look like alternate haplotags. So um, this HiFi assembly is actually public, and we're gonna go through some of it. Um, there are some interesting features about it. This is the HiFi canoe assembly actually aligned against a CS10. This is another reference that was done many years ago. Uh, it's also an NCBI and it's nicely annotated. Um, this one uh, was done with older sequencing technology, but nevertheless still has, I think, 750, uh, 750 KB and 50s from an assembly standpoint. They did some scaffolding as well to clean it up. Um, and then we've done these um, mummer alignments against all the other references from, you know, daughter to mother, father to mother, daughter to father, and the high canoe to CS10. And um, we've also made a female reference that has the Y tacked onto it. You can see some of that up here. Um, and that's just to get an understanding of um, 
what a, what a complete reference would look like if it were um, like the quality of the female plus the Y that we, that we gathered from, from the male. Okay, so um, you can again run these, um, these circles plots to have a look at how the, uh, how the references are lining up with CS10. And you can see there's a lot of symphony here. And there are a couple crossover points that might be real biological differences or, or assembly, uh, misassemblies that we're trying to come through at the moment. But um, not much is known about the diversity of these plants. And so it's quite possible these are, in fact, real biological differences. Um, we also had enough sequence um, quality to start seeing telomeres. We didn't see a lot of telomeres in the previous assembly. Uh, at least they were really short if they existed. Uh, and that's probably an artifact of um, CLR not having high accuracy going into the assembly and then those creating assembly knots. Uh, when you have really high accuracy data going into the assembly, your telomeres kind of stand out because even a single few snips inside those telomeres can actually differentiate them. Uh, and, and so you can see here a collection of about 17 of these telomeres that we have found and their relative length, which we were kind of shocked by that they're this long. Um, and there are a couple of these that if you map them back to CS10, uh, you can see a couple of them that aren't necessarily at the ends of the chromosomes. I mean, these make sense and these make sense, but you know, the, some of some over here may in fact be, um, you know, uh, interstitial um, telomeric repeats, uh, but they, they 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 may map to the end of our chromosomes. So one of these is very long; it's like over 20 kb. That's in the middle of of the CS10 um, genome. So we're still digging into that to see whether that's an assembly artifact or whether that's in fact something that's different between the um, the organisms. But what's nice to see is we can see 25 kb telomeres or even 40 kb telomeres with this hi-fi technique and uh, we were never able to see those before. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, the other thing that we can see are microsatellites quite clearly. So if you were to look at this, um, uh, this chart here, what we're looking at is the various different genome assemblies that are in NCBI. And some of these date back 10 years and they're, and they're quite rough. They're alumina only and so they're heavily fragmented. The N50s are listed there in the parentheses. So many of them are in fact 3 kb N50 assemblies. Um, and as you go up in time, they get a little bit longer as a sequencing technology gets better. Uh, and you can get a sense of how many SSRs there are per base. And what you naturally see is a real different spike here uh, or, or, or a depression here. But this is really an increase in the number of SSRs per, per kilobase. Uh, so the Y chromosome is an outlier. It has like twice or three times the density of these repeats uh, than we see on the other, other chromosomes. That's kind of interesting. And it lines up with some of the literature as well. Um, you can see the estimates of the, um, the genomes over here, X and Y, in terms of size and total contents that exist in there. And then when we run LTR over these things, uh, LTR finder or, or UREd, you can see various amounts of the genome that are in fact uh, LTR or repeats. And you can see it's a really, a really high fraction of this genome, 65% to, uh, up, when you get to the Y chromosome, it's upwards to 83% of the Y chromosome is, uh, is LTR. So lots of LTRs and uh, simple sequence repeats. And when we look at the references, these seem to be where all the breakpoints are. Uh, most of the, the terminal ends of the contigs are SSRs, um, very long ones that aren't getting um, you know, put together in the assembly correctly. So we think we understand where all the gaps are and we think we understand their structure as well. Uh, we have done some hi-fi on this, um, and this is just a, you know, an, a sense of what this hi-fi data looks uh, if you map it to different references. So this is actually our hi-fi, or hi-c, sorry, our hi-c data mapped to CS10 and our hi-c data mapped to some of our assemblies. This is another assembly that came out uh, very recently from China, also named JL, by the way, just, just not, not, not Jamaican lion like the one that we're um, sequencing, but a different JL. Um, so high seek gives us some information where that we can hang these genetic maps on. So we did do a cross uh, with Oregon CBD where they um, ran several hundred um, F2s and um, we then took those genetic markers and ran them through some tools to see if they co-inherited. In fact, everything here in these colored boxes are all linkage groups um, that have co-inherited um, uh, SNPs, if you will, from, uh, from the linkage study. So we're starting to get a really nice concordance between the linkage, linkage maps and the actual high C data that's been that's generated to create these scaffolds. So that's, that's actually quite reassuring to see. Uh, so from here, we've gone on to, to categorize SNPs. Uh, and some of the interest here was to build a SNP chip. So we, there's about 58 million SNPs in these 42 whole genome shotguns. Um, you can see there's a bit of a dip here because these are all related to Jamaican lion. So there's less, obviously, polymorphism between the family members. But um, there's also a heightened amount of variation when you compare um, the, uh, the hemp lines to these, these um, Jamaican lion 
references. Uh, so there's elevated amounts of variation in hemp compared to some of the drug types. So the Jamaican line one is, is a little bit more, I think, leaning in relationship to the drug types than it is the hemp lines. Uh, it is a type two plant. It makes uh, both CBD and THC and high amounts of it. Um, now with that, we can do copy number variation. Now we were very careful when we did the Illumina sequencing uh, to do only five cycles of PCR and have uh, barcodes, UMIs involved so that we could deduplicate any of the data. Um, a lot of this copy number done with, copy number work was done without deduplicating. We didn't need to, there's so few cycles. Um, so, uh, but, it's, but we do have that data if we ever need to go back for it. So what you can see here uh, are the Jamaican line cultivars over here in purple. And when things go red, they are duplicated. And when they go blue, they are deleted. And so you can see amongst these many different cannabinoid synthase genes that we have in the genome, that there are a lot of areas that are duplicated or deleted in respect to the reference sequence. Uh, that's very interesting to us because um, some of these deleted genes, uh, particularly the ones here, um, are the cannabichromine synthase cluster. And on those same contigs and phase are these genes down here. Uh, so some clients want to breed for deletions of cannabichromine because they're afraid that it's a, it's a sloppy enzyme and it can also make a little bit of THC. And there are limitations on how much THC your plants can have. And so paying close attention to all the cannabinoid synthase genes in the process of breeding is really critical. Uh, there are um, regulations that, that uh, at the DEA and the USDA, that if you if your if your farm goes over 0.3 percent THC, they can burn it down. So um, this is really the, the one of the most important markers in cannabis to be paying attention to. And, and it's important to know when you select in breeding if you're going to knock out other genes. Like some of these genes down here are involved in pathogen response. So uh, you got to be careful in the process of breeding so that uh, if you're going to drive for particular cannabinoid synthase genes, that you don't drive out pathogen resistance with it. Um, over here are pathogen response genes, not necessarily the same ones. These are some other ones that we focused on, uh, the chitinases, the TLPs, and uh, MLO, which is a mildew uh, resistance lo loci that's described in hops. And we're just looking at copy number variation here as well to see if there's anything striking um, that, that stands out. Uh, we haven't gone deep into this, into the single nucleotide variation level yet. We're just looking at copy number. And you can actively see um, some of these copy number changes uh, that's governing the cannabinoid content, and this is one that's quite well known as, known as the BTBD allele. It had never been previously described as to where it was in the genome until this um, preprint came out. But now it's pretty obvious that this is a copy number change, that your, 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 your plant either has a complete deletion of um, the active CBDA synthase, uh, or it has an active form of THC synthase, and it has one or the other. Um, sometimes it can have both, like you have here in the middle, and those are type 2 plants. But if you're type 1 plants, you have an active THC synthase, and you don't have an active CBD synthase. And if you're type 3 plant, you can make CBD synthase, and you can't make THC synthase. And if you're type 2, you can make both. Uh, we have seen some single nucleotide polymorphisms that also mimic this, but this is by far the dominant um, pattern that we see across the, the genetics. Um, now, I mentioned before that there are similar... Um, there are some of these genes that are coming along for the ride in some cultivars, but not all of them, all right? And these are gibberellin transporters, viral defense genes, PAMP-induced secreted peptides, aquaporin, so all things that we got to pay attention to uh, if you're going to select for one of these um, uh, types of cannabinoid synthases to be present. So um, it's a big region. It's a two megabase um, cannabichromine deletion. Uh, we can also see really readily which ones are males and females with maps like this, okay? So the females have absolutely no coverage on the Y chromosome and the males do. Okay, so we've now got these references, and this means that a lot of our Illumina data become, be, be, can become a lot more illuminated, uh, if you will. Um, the short reads are very difficult to work with in these repetitive genomes. Um, but once you have a really good reference, they map much more meaningfully. You're not, you're, you don't get uh, uh, these really messy alignments. Uh, and so now we can just use the Illumina data to show us which one of these genes are present. Do we have THC synthase? Do we have CBD synthase? Uh, or are they missing? Um, so this, this gets classified as a type one plant. Um, this is one that happens to have two point mutations in THC synthase. So if we only look at copy number mutations, the copy number variants, we could miss things like this. So it is important to get down to the single base level because there are these rare variants that knock out THC synthase. This is in fact a type four plant, uh, meaning it doesn't make THC or CBD, uh, it makes cannabigerol. Uh, which is the precursor. And so this gene by copy number is there, but is deactivated by two point mutations and actually is, is dysfunctional. So, um, and uh, it doesn't make any CBD synthase either. 
uh, we can chart the heterozygosity of these uh, with this tool. And of course, uh, there's like a little bit of a 23andMe-like report on the variants that we can find um, in, in the genome. This leads us to Canopedia, where a lot of this data is stored. So this is a public repository of sequence data. You can download any of this data. A lot of growers put their, their data up here just for comparing notes and to figure out what to breed with, and also as an intellectual property, uh, public domain space, if you will. Um, and there's a phylogenetic tree that helps understand uh, what you're related to and what you might want to breed with. Um, and it tracks a lot of these uh, genetics for you as well. And it, it, now that we have the Y chromosome in there, we can discern whether plants are male or female just off the of sequencing data alone. Uh, the relationships can be helpful. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at uh, particular patent rights, there is uh, a plant patent rights that, are, uh, that, that govern clones. And so clones need to be genetically identical. Um, there's also, um, there's other forms of IP as well that, that are a little bit broader and, and may require to know whether or not your cultivar is in fact unique. And we can discern that from looking at our database and also other public databases that we've scraped into this from NCBI. Um, I think we've gone over this enough. Um, what I want to do is, trend, is, is, is give you a sense of how the sequencing data um, actually um, will look on, a, on, an, on an Illumina array, because we built a, a cannabis SNP chip off of this reference as well. Uh, and so you saw these sequence coverage maps over these contigs, and you can tell this is a type 1 plant because it has THC synthase, and it has the inactive form, the deleted form of CBD synthase. That tells us that the, these two are actually in linkage together, so the, we look for both of these. Uh, and when they're present, we know it's a type 1. When all three of them are present, we know it's a type 2. It can make both THC and CBD. When these two are missing and this is present, we know it's a type 3. And when they're all gone, we know it's a type 4. And there are some exceptions, as I showed you before, with point mutations that we have to scan for as well. So we want to convert this type of assay onto a SNP chip. Uh, and uh, we've done that now with urofins. And we built an Illumina, a 90K SNP array from Illumina. And so, of course, the question is, can you pick up these copy number changes on the SNP chip? because uh, it's a very repetitive genome. Uh, and these are just some of the histograms of the signal where you can see all of the uh, male signal uh, across the Y gives you a log ratio and signal on the top, and the females don't give you any. And this sample here, in fact, must be a female because it's gray and it overlaps with what the females look like. And over, of course, over here, we, have, we see the opposite. This is a male sample. So we can readily track these 3,000 markers across the Y chromosome and figure out males and females. Well, that's kind of easy. That's like shooting fish in a barrel. How about the smaller regions? What about THC synthase, which is really only uh, you know, a 2,000, uh, 2 kb region of the genome? Can you pick up that copy number variation? That's really small. Um, well, in fact, you can see that listed here. This is THC positive, THC negative. So you can see the, 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 the sample that we're using here is hanging down here with no signal over the region, and the sample above uh, here has, has signal in the region. So this tells us it's THC positive. Um, this all is possible because of all the whole genome sequencing we did prior to this. Can have a chromine synthase as well. We can pick that up on the chip, and CBDA synthase we can pick up on the chip. So all of them, sh all of them show up on, on the Illumina SNP arrays, and we, we, we can now type those things. We can type a few other things as well on these SNP arrays. There's, there's, there's 12.6 thousand distinct genes covered by at least one variant. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's 3.3 thousand um, uh, Y chromosomes. We can determine type 1, 2, and 3 with a chip. Um, there's a lot of variants that are also tiled through here. We're still working on extracting these, but we are getting genotyping calls internal to the genes, which is really interesting to us. Uh, and there's other synthase genes we've thrown on the chip. Uh, we have cannabichromine in there. We have a levitolic cyclase in there, uh, levitolic acid cyclase. We have some of the parental transferases in there uh, and the TKs. So the, these are... Um, important genes in the cannabinoid synthesis pathway. There's also terpene synthesis genes that were described by Keith Allen's group, Zager and Booth, um, that we've thrown in there. The canflavin synthesis pathways on the chip, the chitinases, the TLPs, and the MLOs are on the chip, uh, and um, some of the adestin genes. And then we also evenly spaced uh, a bunch of markers across the, across the genome so that you can get some linkage information. And uh, we also had about six and a half thousand of them overlap our sequencing panels that we use. We do have some exon-like approaches as well. And we just wanted to make sure we could intersect all that data. So um, very helpful um, and diverse chip uh, that's available now. People can use it. Um, give us a ring if you're interested. Um, but speaking of pathogens, uh, I want to just wrap this up by talking about some of the things uh, we've hunted down out of the data, and then also point out a couple of markers that some of our customers who first used this chip have, have isolated. They're all very interesting stories. Uh, we did do some isoseq with PacBio on this genome to understand the expression patterns across five tissues, which is what you're seeing over here on the left. And this, this um, led us to be able to characterize 
which one of the genes, particularly the pathogen response genes that were hyper expressed in the plant. And some of these red ones over here are the chitinases um, that we picked up and cloned. Uh, we also had some methylation data to help confirm this that showed us that some of the, the promoters on these um, kinase genes were, were heavily methylated, and, or differentially methylated, I should say. Um, so from there, we cloned a couple of the kinases and some of the thalmatine-like proteins, um, and then began running assays to look at their effectiveness in, in vitro. Uh, we ran this beta-glucanase assay to demonstrate that it, in fact, does uh, degrade glucan, like TLP should. Uh, and we also have a kinase assay uh, that we've been running. Uh, and uh, then we ran these other forms of the assay that just plate these things and you put different tabs on the, on the, um, uh, on the plating medium with different amounts of enzyme and see if you can get the enzyme to actually retard the growth of the colony. And while this isn't quantitative, it's quite visual. Uh, and we can see cases where these enzymes have a dramatic effect on the growth of um, a particular fungi. But the real, I think, the most telling story is the quantitative PCR story. So you can take these enzymes now these cannabis-based chitinases and TLPs that we cloned into E. coli, expressed at high levels, we can add them to, to broths, put the microbes that we typically find in cannabis in the broths, and then quantitate, uh, do we slow down the growth? And by how many CTs do we slow down the growth? And you can see some of those shifts here, that there are uh, four to 64 fold reductions on, on some of the first tries that we had on this, throwing these enzymes in here, we can get a, a massive reduction in the amount of, of growth by having TOPs and chitinases present there. So, so the enzymes work outside of cannabis and um, we're now utilizing them inside of our products that we have to detect yeast and mold in cannabis because we find that these enzymes do a far better job lysing open yeasts uh, and, uh, and other molds. So we get better DNA yields by utilizing these enzymes in um, in, in, the, in the pathoseq pipeline. Now with that, we're taking those enzymes through the AOAC process. Um, this is a process for, um, that we're using to certify our yeast and mold test. Uh, and with this means we're taking a lot of organisms off of cannabis, we're sequencing them, uh, and we're plating them on various mediums to see how well they grow on different mediums, and then um, understanding how well they actually QPCR with our, with our process so that we can see that if our QPCR properly correlates with these. Uh, we're also doing this with viruses. There's a lot of um, cannabis viruses that we can now ascertain now that we have a good reference. Um, these uh, viruses, uh, Hops latent viroid, lettuce chlorosis virus, and cannabis cryptic virus are things that infect grows and can wreck crops by 30% yield. Uh, particularly lettuce, lettuce chlorosis and Hops latent viroid are really damaging. Um, and once you don't really see them until they start flowering, but we are able to pick them up in, in the early veg state and screen mother plants so that they don't end up, you know, end up cloning off the mother plant, a bunch of viroid or, or uh, infected material, and only discovering that when you get late stage into, uh, into flower. That can be really expensive. So we can now do that with um, qPCR, thanks to many of these references that are built. This gives you a sign of what these viruses do in some of these grows. They really do just destroy the photosynthesis capacity of the plant, uh, making it very difficult for you to push the plants through flowering. Um, so there's a variety of different um, tools out there you can now use off of this Jamaican lion reference. There are companies that have built exomes or mini exomes from Arbor and Agilent. Um, Eurofins has built a snip chip off of this reference and other people have begin to tissue culture this, this uh, cultivar so that we have a genetic resource uh, that we can work with. And um, by far the Jamaican lion reference is becoming, is probably is the most data aligned to it of any other reference just based on its, uh, its length. Um, now with this, uh, we did a field trial with Oregon CBD is um, they, uh, after running all those SNP chips that we did a linkage map on, they, they were careful to select some other interesting cultivars. They looked for some cultivars of theirs that had a, that autoflower. This is important because if you can understand the autoflower genetics, you can get an extra crop cycle in the wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and uh, they also looked for another marker related to varin production in, in the cannabinoids. Uh, the, the varins are an altered form of cannabinoid as a shorter um, pencil side chain. Um, it ends up having a propyl side chain instead of a pencil side chain of the molecule, and that is not uh, as strictly regulated as THC. So if you can breed for plants that have varins, you can still get cannabinoids that aren't necessarily psychoactive but are still therapeutic, and uh, those cannabinoids um, aren't regulated as tightly. So there's, there's a really intense interest in understanding those genetics. Well, out of this first run uh, of a couple hundred samples, uh, the group there already found uh, a four different markers that they can then graduate into a PCR um, pipeline to screen plants. So now, instead of growing all of the plants out to full maturity to monitor these things, they can screen them uh, on pallets 
at a seedling stage. So their R&D room went from the size of this grow here on the right to something that can fit in a couple tables by having a quantitative PCR <clears throat> instrument that could track these markers. So this is very helpful for growers that need a shrink footprint uh, and accelerate the breeding timeframes. Um, by screening these things at an early stage, you don't have to wait for these plants to mature. These things can take 10 to 16 weeks to mature. So uh, you can really do your selection, your culling much sooner and save on light space and everything else. Um, there are public genome browsers now that we have been feeding a lot of this data into. There's one up at Koji, encourage other, everyone to go there. We have um, probably 50 whole genomes up there and 50 of these exomes and a variety of other um, tools people can play with uh, to get a better understanding of the data. All of the expression data is in there and I think the methylation data is in there as well. And I wanna thank all of these other participants. This, was, uh, this took a village. Uh, we had a lot of uh, folks help on this from PacBio to uh, NEB to Phase Genomics, Agilent, Icon, Arbor, um, and everyone at Medicinal Genomics. This, um, this took uh, a, a tremendous amount of diversity. We couldn't get this all under one roof, so um, we opted to, uh, to collaborate with many in the field to, uh, to make these assays and to get these genomes public. And I wanna thank all of these people for participating because it has been a several year project and has been very fruitful. Thank you. <laughs>